Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 12th and final round. Right hand, Golovkin steps in and down he goes again. Unbelievable. Mayweather makes a pay. What a rookie mistake. A sensational left hook by Delaware. It's facts. I'm the best. You know what I mean? I sometimes I don't want to believe in myself, but it's the truth. I'm the best. I'm going to show you how great I am. From Southern California, this is the Last Round Podcast. Okay, so here immediately after the Wilder Fury press conference, the second press conference here in uh, Los Angeles at the Fox Sports Studios, Fox Studios essentially, um, here with BT Sports, Tris Dixon. Um, we've been trying to get you the whole day, but you've been, <laughs> you've been pulled over there, over here, and, but luckily you found some time, so we appreciate you jumping on the last round here. Sorry, man, I've just got to run. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> oh, man, I you for the door open. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I po- ap- apologies for that. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit crazy because we're trying to turn around a show, I think, for tomorrow already, mm-hmm. just based on the press conference. Right. So we kind of had to grab everything, you know, as and when. So, yeah, it's been, it's been one of those days, but it's been good. Right, right. So um, how long have you been in, over here in L.A. now, right now? So we arrived in L.A. Uh, yesterday morning from Las Vegas. So we we just done some our big sit-downs with Tyson, which I did a couple of days ago. We left LA, for L.A. the morning yesterday morning, and we did a huge exclusive in L.A. yesterday, which I can't say who it is because <laughs> it's all all uh, when is that all supposed to come out? Dagger stuff. Hey. When does it come out? When does it come out? It's on BT Sport um, on the Saturday, I think, before the fight week. Oh wow! So okay. Saturday before fight week. Right. And um, yeah, so then, so that, so that, so we did that, and then we're in town today at the press conference tomorrow. Hopefully, going to pick up a couple of other guys in LA for interviews. Then on Monday, we go across to Alabama and spend a couple of days with Team Wilder. So, out of all the stuff that you got to today, talking to Tyson and, and Wilder. Um, did you get any good any good quotes, any good information from them today? Yeah, there was some good stuff. I thought they were both in the mood. And I mean, I, I've known Deontay since 2008, since the Olympics, so we've gone back quite a long way. Um, I've seemed to, I seem to think, uh, I'm not trying to uh, blow my own trumpet, but <laughs> like, um, I think I was the first English guy to, to, be, to start covering Deontay's career. Oh, wow. Uh, and we hooked up at the Hall of Fame in Canastota after he won his Olympic medal. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we sort of always stayed in touch loosely. Um, so, yeah, so those, those guys are open. And Tyson, uh, in the three interviews I've done with him this week, has been great and, and been really good company. So, yeah, they've had some really good things to say for themselves. And not just the normal sound bites, you know, there's been a, a little bit more depth to the interviews, which is great because at these press events when you just grab them for a couple of minutes you kind of just get the same old stuff but they right. both were quite considered about the stuff they were saying I think they are playing you know there, I think there is an element of psychological mind games and them them putting a lot of value in, in what they're saying and mm-hmm. meaning what they say and not just te- not just taking the time to use throwaway lines what's your what's your take on uh, I don't know if he's coming out right now or not um, but Bob Arum had previously said that um, well there's Wilder do you need Wilder no, already spoken to Deontay. Okay, great, great. Uh, see you guys. See you next week. Cause see you, Chris. Thanks, ob- man. Obviously, people can't see us right now, but we're right outside the entrance, so there's a bunch of people walking by, and so while they're just walking by, and we know your BT Sport crew's out there waiting. You know, I know you guys are waiting for Fury, but um, but you, but your take on a we were talking about this earlier. Um, Bob Arum had been saying the last month or so that there wasn't any plans for press conferences for this fight um, because they were just going to use a promotional machine behind Fox and ESPN. But there's been two now. W- what's your take on that? I mean, it's is interesting, it- isn't it? Um, you know, it's, it's hard to gauge how big these guys are in the US. Mm-hmm. I think in the UK, we know that Tyson's huge. And I think Deontay Wilder, he's had a couple of successful uh, promotional trips uh, in the last 12 months where he's gone over and he's worked with friends and he's st- stopped traffic in some cities. And, yeah. stuff. <laughs> and he's caused a bit of a fuss and he's always had good exposure on BT Sport. Um, and so I think they're bigger stars in the UK, arguably. But the thing is, the numbers over here just make insane sense. And mm-hmm. obviously, with the promotional machine of Fox, PBC, uh, and ESPN, and everything behind that, it's just such a huge machine. I think the problem is, when you look at those numbers, you take it for granted that there's going to be an instant transfer. Mm-hmm. And I still think that, that fights need the proper promotion and a big promotion for there to be a big song and a dance about it. I don't think that's... 
I don't think you need to reinvent the wheel. And I, you can't. And it, the marketplace is so big. The consumer marketplace is so big. If people want to spend their money on something, they need to know what they're going to spend their money on. You need to educate. And these press conferences have a role in, in educating fight, fight fans and casual fans about what they what they might be missing out on if they don't get it. Speaking, speaking of like you know consumer buying, and this is obviously a pay per view, joint pay per view between ESPN and Fox. Um, we asked, we talked to, to Steve Kim about this earlier from ESPN. Um, now that DAZN's been in the game for like about two years now, um, in the boxing game, they're a streaming service like a Netflix and stuff like that. Um, eventually, somebody from the DAZN platform is going to be able to make a cross promotional fight from somebody with another network. How would that work in terms of like? pay-per-view because i mean they're a streaming service what, what do you yeah, think i don't know it would be chaos i think they'd probably have to go see if they could do a pay-per-view one-off event i'm not i'm not sure logistically how that will work it would be as you say it would be the first time ever in history and you know you'd like to think it, it, you would like to think it's inevitable it's going to happen because in order to get the big fights and the very best fights sometimes you're going to have to cross platforms right. and cross networks and that's the only way it's going to happen how they do it how they make it happen i've got no idea Eddie Holm touched on in a recent interview that he said they called the second press conference because of bad ticket sales. Um, were you surprised that this press conference was so timid? I thought it would be kind of a lot more Tyson getting in his face because I think one of the tools that Tyson uses very well is he manages to get under people's skin even before they enter the ring. I think the thing is with Tyson, he, is, he loves playing the game. And so just because he was like that this way, uh, on like that today doesn't mean that's what's going to happen the next time he sees him so maybe he's trying to lull him into a false insecurity and the next time he sees him he'll blow his top right. I think it's the inconsistency <laughs> and unpredictability of Tyson hmm. that you know today it was very cordial and respectful you should find and I think there's a place for that with fight fans you know some guys just are done with all the false grudges and the fake narratives and stuff sometimes it's good for the guys just to say handshake you're a good fighter I'm a good fighter let's find out who's, who's better I prefer that old style, that old school f way of business, but um, it's, it's, it's tough, you know, it's, it's tough to know what's best. You know, obviously a push and a shove gets on the highlight reels and all the newscasts and that, so <laughs> yeah. what can you do? One of the major changes obviously going into this second fight is uh, Ben Davidson up now being in the corner for Tyson. How was the uh, reaction back in England? Um, it's an interesting question. I wrote a column actually for Boxing Scene on this a, a, a month or two ago. And I, I've, I'm surprised it hasn't had more headlines. You know, these guys have been through so much together. And Ben's been a massive part of the journey. And they were so tight and such good friends that it's very curious, like, at such short notice that it's all changed in the camp. So, I mean, I, it's, it's hard to... It's, hard, it's gone a little bit under the radar. You know, I can't understand why people aren't saying it's a massive story and uh, maybe, maybe it would just be uh, maybe it'll depend on what happens on fight night mm. and maybe it'll be with retrospect if if there's something severely different to what happened the first time around mm -hmm. then maybe there'll be more of an inquest about what happened with ben uh, but right now i mean there seems to be a lot of people very accepting of the situation when i thought that you know for the longest time i thought that as long as tyson was boxing him and ben were going to be in the same on the same page and in the same team for sure and do you think it's just kind of PR where Tyson says that he's going to try and knock him out? Because obviously he's the master boxer. And when you see someone like, say you call Deontay Wilder a slugger, you would normally pick the boxer because you know that you can just kind of dance around, pick him off from the so outside. I think if you listen to what John Fury said, and I think obviously John's got a massive in influence uh, with, with his son, I think, you know, the whole thing is to stay elusive but to start putting on Wilder a bit more and to, to be a bit more physical and grind him down, push him around, shove him around. Obviously, with Deontay came in super light for their first fight, right. which sort of took people by surprise. And so I think they're going to try and make the most of being physically larger. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what they mean in terms of being aggressive. Um, you know, the, the problem is with that is then you, for long periods of time, you're going to be in the pocket with a puncher mm -hmm. and not just any puncher, but with Deontay Wilder, who's got this insane knockout ratio. So, um, you know, that, that's what I think. They, they're looking at being more aggressive, and that's what I'm taking from that is the sense they're going to try and be more physical. And I think, obviously, when you look at the end of the first fight, Deontay was sort of, he looked to be more fatigued than Tyson. Mm -hmm. So I think they're thinking that Tyson's got a bit more in the tank down in the later rounds than Deontay. So if they stick it on him earlier, then there's going to be even less left of Deontay in the late rounds. Right. Obviously, that's a gamble, but... You know, that's the, that seems to be what they're looking at tactically. Who do you think has a better resume out of both of them? That was a question they um, asked earlier. Yeah, I think so. I think obviously Tyson has the standout win over Klitschko, 
and Wilder's probably fought the better guys. Um, you know, it depends on what you like out of that. <laughs> um, you know, in terms of Hall of Fame credentials, which, you know, long story short, as heavyweight champions, you, you need to be looking at that. It's hard to make a case for either, really, at the moment, when you look at what they've done. Right. Um, you know, and I suppose in that respect, if with Fury being the moral victor, you'd have to say that his credentials for the Hall of Fame would probably be a little bit stronger than Wilder's. Mm -hmm. But then it's tough because then you're weighing up Wilder's longevity as well. So you've got to put that in the mix. It's a difficult question. It's a good question. And when you say who's had the better career, it's difficult. Do you agree with something that AJ said this week that Tyson needs to fight, obviously AJ, maybe Dylan White, Andy Ruiz, Parker, just to kind of pad out his resume because, you know, Tyson says he's going to have three more fights then retire. Do you think for his legacy, he needs to have a bigger roster of names? For his legacy, yeah, for sure. I think that would really strengthen his legacy. But in terms of what he wants out of the sport and in terms of finances, probably not. You know, he's, you know, he's proved that he can make good money for those two comeback fights he had with Seferi and Pianetta. There was good money floating around for them. There was good money for Wallin um, and Tom Schwartz. So why are you going to fight Povetkin mm -hmm. and Luis Ortiz if you can make mega bucks fighting Tom Schwartz? You know, uh, I'm, I'm all... I, I'm quite an old school guy. I love a guy with a strong legacy and, you know, where you can't do any, where you can't deny his credentials. But I've also seen a lot of people washed up in this sport and I've seen the sport take far more from people than they've got out of it. Right. And so if someone like a Floyd Mayweather can make a, sh a shed load of money <laughs> and leave the sport intact mm -hmm. and they can play the game and they can play the sport, then fair play to them because not many fighters have done that. Another thing that kind of went under the radar, I thought, is that the last fight, the MVP of the fight, was Jorge Capetillo, uh, cut Tyson Fury's cut man. And then this time around, he's you know out in the wilderness and they brought in Stitch Duran. I've heard this, so. Uh, so Jorge wasn't like he's not a, a cut man in essence. He ended up having to do a lot of work that I don't think anyone expected him to, to have to do. But also, some people criticised his work in that fight. You mm -hmm. know, not everyone was saying he saved him. There was a narrative that saying that he did, and obviously the fact that the fight was allowed to go on meant that it was all okay on the night, and it was all right. right on the night. But there are some people. I was speaking to Mike Coppinger of the Athletic today, <laughs> where some people thought that his work on the cut wasn't great and that it could have been um, it could have been dealt with differently and that it could have been treated differently and so you know if there's anyone questioning his credentials well you can't really question those of Stitch Duran can you? True it's very true uh, and if you're looking for quality in the corner um, you know it's tough you know you can make a case and say oh well he should be loyal to this and you know it's a short career and you've got to do what's best for you and if that's what they think is best for them then again it's one of those if there's a cut and Stitch <laughs> Duran can't, can't, can't stem it everyone say oh well look what Capitillo did in the last fight it's one of those you know perhaps you're damned if you do perhaps you're damned if you don't but if you don't make a change you know, all he's trying to do is strengthen the team and strengthen mm -hmm. it and reinforce it whether or not he has obviously only time will tell but you can't fault uh, Duran's credentials for sure. Do you think AJ pulled a, a Floyd Mayweather saying he was going to come over and help out with sparring for Fury? <laughs> that was a weird one, wasn't it? It was clearly <laughs> never going to happen. Yeah, I don't really know what he was trying to achieve with that because it's not like he needs the headlines either. Um, that was all. That was curious. I, yeah, I didn't really get that. Um, and like I said, it was obviously never going to happen. It was a bit of a head scratcher. Um, and it's not even one of those things that's particularly interesting. So it's not like it was just going to get loads of headlines mm -hmm. on the back pages. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, strange one that, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to, I don't really know what to say. It was, a, it was a peculiar thing, isn't it? I mean, you just it's not the sort of thing that happens in the heavyweights. And he was never going to do it because then they could scout one another. Mm, right. You know. I, strange. Do you think they're really going to try to block out, like Wilder, Fury, they're really going to try to block out AJ for as long as they can so he won't get a piece of this money pie? Uh, Even though he can make yeah, his own money. I, yeah, I th yeah, I mean, obviously, I think it sounds like there's a deal in place for a third fight if Fury wins. Right. Um, I'm not sure now that they've now that they've been on this sort of treadmill for 15 months between them so far and they've got this fight coming up. I'm not sure that they're so keen to do it now. I think that at the time where there was offers and there was talks about A-side and B-side, I think people legitimately rubbed each other up the wrong way in negotiations and they did think to hell with AJ. Right. I think now they feel that AJ's sort of gone to his naughty corner. He got knocked out by Ruiz, which they probably took great delight in because obviously <laughs> to, in many ways that lowers his market yeah. value, losing his unbeaten record and so forth. 
So I think, you know, and now I think they'd be more accommodating. And now obviously Joshua's lost. That obviously changes the the type of fight they might think they'd have as well because mm -hmm. you know the Joshua had a lot of momentum going into that first Ruiz fight, and now they might have just seen a couple of chinks that weren't there previously. You just touched on Ruiz. What do you think of the news uh, Andy Ruiz's split from Manny Robles? Shame, isn't it? You know, when these guys go through these highs together, you don't want to accept that there's going to be lows coming around the corner. It seemed like such a good story, but. Also, you know, it sounded like Manny was having a hard time getting Andy into camp for the last fight. So, you know, if you're not listening to your trainer and you don't respect him, then it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not the right, it's not the right relationship. Clearly, right. you know, you need to be able to, you need to respect your trainer. You need to be able to listen to him. You need to have full faith and trust in him. But you also need to place that trust in him. You know, there's no point in the trainer showing up and the fighter not showing up. There's no point in the trainer buying into it, the fighter not buying into it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, really, I guess that was only going to go one way. Rumor has it he may be flying out to someone you, you know very well, Teddy Atlas. Yeah, I mean, what a mental idea that is. <laughs> You've got this guy with such ill discipline, apparently, going to train with this, with this um, guy who's so big on discipline. Um, Should do a reality TV show, I think, for the, for the seven to ten day trial. I mean, it just seems to be a match made in absolute hell. <laughs> um, I, you can't see, I can't see it working out. I mean, I, I'd love to be wrong because Tyson, because uh, Teddy's good with these guys. And like I said, though, the, the guy needs to buy into Teddy. Right. And... And maybe, and maybe there's something Andy realizes he hasn't got that means he needs to buy into Teddy and his discipline and his structure. But I can't see it, you know, leopards and spots and all that. And, you know, Andy hasn't shown through his career, I think his top rank would say as well, like he hasn't showed that prolonged spirit of dedication. And that's what you need to get Teddy's interest. Um, it's tough. It's, t it's, 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 I can't, I just can't see it working for the life of me. But if it did, what a story, hey? Right. Steve Kim told us earlier that um, he felt that if Ruiz would have won the rematch, especially in knockout fashion like he did the first one, then Ruiz had a very good chance at being the number one star, especially Mexican star, and take over that money pie like at, for Canelo. Do you agree with that? Quite possibly, yeah. And I mean, obviously, the thing is, then it's a momentum game, isn't it? it, can, it you know, because obviously he was a, a PBC guy, so if he kicked on and then unified against Wilder, yeah. then obviously, then you're looking at the next level again. And then if he defended against Fury and beat him, then, you know, so maybe not after that one fight, maybe not after the rematch, but certainly, like, it, the, the whole world was in his hands. Mm -hmm. Um and he might, you know, from what he's said afterwards, he's, he rues the day that he didn't take it seriously in training camp. And I do wonder, like, these guys, does, does Andy Ruiz not know the business well enough that if you don't show up, you're not going to get a third fight? Right. Or did he think he was going to walk through Joshua? I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to explain. It's hard to put your finger on what it, what it was. Um, I don't know for sure, but... Um, you know, obviously there, there wasn't many cries for a third fight because he was so comprehensively beaten and, and right. he, didn't do, he didn't offer anything. And the fact that he showed he didn't show up in shape and he even admitted that, well, why is anyone going to invest their hard-earned money to go and watch him if, if they can't be sure that he's going to show up in shape again? What do you, th what do you think about um, Andy Ruiz's dad telling Manny Robles is that it was Al Hamas' decision to let Manny Ro Robles go? tough isn't it when you get I mean I don't know exactly who said what to whom and you know you hear this stuff all the time in boxing there's a report about that yeah then, you know. but with other people getting involved and it's tough you know families obviously only want what's best for, for their you know mm -hmm. dads only want what's best for their sons but a lot of these a lot of these families that get involved they're not boxing people and they don't necessarily know what is for the best right. but one thing you do know for sure is if 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 Andy doesn't respect Manny enough to to train him mm -hmm. then he's better off going somewhere else mm -hmm. you need to train with so you need you need to be trained by someone that you respect because you're going to have to listen to them and you need to buy into them and you need when you go back to the corner in a fight you need to know that you want that person in your corner fighting with you mm -hmm. um, and if and if you go back to someone you don't really respect think you're, you're on your own it's no point having a trainer right Sean Porter was here obviously he's one of the top welterweights in the, in the world today um, Great. and then Terence Crawford is obviously in that limbo right now. He's got a world title at 147, but 
there can't be any deals done with these PBC welterweights. Um, what's your take on that in terms of Porter has made it known at least the last few months that he'd be willing to fight Crawford, and then they've a- there's been interviewers who have asked Crawford about fighting Porter, and he kind of brushed it off, kind of saying he wants Spence. Um, what do you think about that? Um, you know, Sean Porter, what, what a great guy and what a <laughs> fighter. And you know he, you know full well he'd be one of those guys that would fight across the street. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> he just doesn't care. He'll fight everybody. He's proven that over time. Um, I heard that he was possibly in the frame for Pacquiao as well. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Porter, Porter's the guy. If anyone's going to not jump ship, but if anyone's going to test the waters and, and ask and pr- be a, what a measuring stick that would be for Crawford. You know, people saying that he hasn't had that definitive challenge at 147. Mm-hmm. What a great, you know, I'm not going to say Sean Porter's a gatekeeper because he's not, but that proves a lot if you can beat Sean Porter at 147, 100%. Well, Tris, we appreciate your time. We, got, we know you're a busy guy, so um, go ahead and plug your podcast and everything you got coming up. Yeah, if you guys haven't listened to, to, to my podcast, I have one called Boxing Life Stories, which is like a deep dive into personalities of boxing. And, and it's very good. We're fans. So, so, thank you yeah. very much. I really appreciate that. Uh, it's only, I'm only a little independent you know, guy who just does it out of my spare room, apart from obviously when I go and visit the guys, then I right. go to my spare room, which Jane Couch did, but that's another story. Uh, anyway, yeah, <laughs> that sounds <laughs> weird uh, we'll get to that po- later yeah the <laughs> podcast isn't as weird as all that I uh, just generally straight shoot some hard, uh, you know I try and ask the guys some hard questions I think that people um, you know if there's myths I try to bust myths about people and if there's if there's people that uh, people might feel a certain way about it's nice to always change the perceptions about these guys in fact my next guest next week is Chris Eubank Jr so uh, nice. I think that might uh, bust a couple of myths I really like Chris Eubank Jr he's a good Good guy, speaks his mind, independent, uh, got a lot of time for him, good story. You, um, you, you, you got a book as well, too? Or you just finished yeah, so, a book? Yeah, I've got a book coming out uh, called um, Damage, which is about CTE and boxing. Um, it's been a labor of love in many ways, that book. I've been working on it for nearly three years. It just, con- it just culminated in Boston, actually, where I was up with uh, Dr. Anne McKee, Chris Nowinski, uh, and Dr. Robert Cantu. Uh, what they do a lot of work for the NFL, and they've they've been really the spearheads behind the concussion crisis through American football over here. Um, and yeah, that's been uh, it's an important subject to me. You know, like I said earlier, uh, when I've seen the sport take so much out of the guys, and obviously I'm talking about CTE and punch drunk syndrome, mm-hmm. you know, whatever you want to call it, dementia pugilistica. Um, and I think it's been a taboo subject for a long period of time. People don't want to talk about it. And a lot of the fighters don't understand it. They don't understand how you get it. They don't understand what they've got when they've got it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I want to make it an open conversation. I don't want to hurt the sport at all. You know, this sport has been great to me for the last 25 years. I love the sport. But I do want to educate people about the, the long-term risks. When people say, oh, I know the dangers of the sport, I get that. But people are talking generally about acute stuff. What happens on fight night? These people think that they might worst case scenario die in the ring or get stretched out they're not thinking of the links to parkinson's alzheimer's mm-hmm. dementia they're not thinking about short-term memory loss depression impulsivity um tremors all the other stuff that comes with it down the line um so yeah so, so it's hopefully it'll be an eye-opening book and also i'm fed up with being one of those journalists where i say something is oh this is an important subject and then you go on to write, talk about the next pay-per-view or do the next big, big interview, and then you've done nothing about such a serious issue. Mm-hmm. This, for me, is something where after 25 years in the sport, I can point to something and say, I didn't just paper over that crack and pretend it didn't exist. Mm-hmm. I've addressed it, and that book now is going to be in the history books. You know, It's always going to be there from now on, or from September anyway. And that's something I'll be able to say with a clear conscience that I've tried to help the sport as best as I possibly could. Well, Tris Dixon, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much for having me, guys. At long last. Thank you very much. Thanks for supporting and listening to the show. Follow us at The Last Round 12 on social media. Rate, review, and subscribe. This is The Last Round Podcast.